Senator Udall. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for appearing here today. I also want to add my uh, voice to those here, Mr. Secretary, and thanking you for your long service uh, to our country, and we wish you well as you return to uh, your walnut farm and your grandchildren uh, in California. Uh, General, I'd like to look more broadly uh, at the challenges that we face in, in Africa, and I want to acknowledge uh, that on September 11, 2012, when this tragic incident occurred, that you were fighting a war in Afghanistan, you were conducting counterterrorism missions all over the globe, training troops, patrolling our skies and seas, hunting war criminals, and providing humanitarian relief. And despite that enormous uh, mission load, you've clearly taken the deaths of these four statement, uh, State Department employees uh, in Benghazi to heart as if they were your own. Uh, and we will learn from this. Uh, we will do everything possible to assure that it doesn't happen again. Secretary Clinton made that clear in her compelling testimony uh, over the last weeks, and, and I know you share that point of view. So again, turning to uh, Africa, uh, I know that we've conducted uh, training and developed partnerships uh, with a number of African militaries for years, uh, I think it's in North Africa as well as in the Sahel. Uh, talk a little bit about those training relationships, uh, those formal ties, and how they're going to help us uh, deny uh, extremists the opportunities to develop footholds in that part of the world. And specifically, should we be expanding training missions like Operation Flintlock or building other DOD, State Department partnership programs in the Africa, AFRICOM OR? The short answer is yes, but I won't, I won't stop at the short answer. The, the, uh, the threat network that exists in North Africa and West Africa um, is a group of disparate organizations, some of which uh, aspire to and have, in fact, embraced the al-Qaeda ideology, uh, who network themselves and syndicate themselves uh, as they find common cause or to take advantage of ungoverned space. And so to your point, Senator, what we're seeing here in the aftermath of call it what you will, the wave, the Arab Spring, the changes in North and West Africa, which have created some ungoverned space, is in fact a place where we have to be very careful not to allow uh, these movements to, to take sanctuary. We are always best at addressing those, working through partners, whether they're bilateral partners. It's a little challenging now to have a relationship with a bilateral military force that is itself brand new in some of these countries. And so we've been also working with regional security apparatus, for example, AMISOM in Somalia, ECOWAS uh, in West Africa, Economic Community of West African States. And, uh, and to your point, though, we do have to do more to uh, enable those partners to control that ungo ungoverned space so that it doesn't become sanctuary. Senator, if I could, uh, Please, Secretary. you know, it, we're, we've been, we've learned a lot uh, about how to confront uh, uh, terrorists and uh, Al Qaeda affiliated groups, uh, not only from what we've done in the Fatah and Afghanistan and Iraq, but the fact is that uh, we have some very effective operations uh, in Yemen. And uh, General Ham did an outstanding job in Somalia, where, you know, a few years ago we thought. Somalia would, had no chance to be able to, uh, to stabilize. Uh, but as a result of uh, the countries in the region, uh, as well as uh, our providing some uh, direct assistance there to uh, assist the forces there and to be able to, uh, to get the intelligence they needed to, to go after al-Shabaab, uh, we had a very effective operation there uh, at uh, undermining uh, al-Shabaab and their strength in, in Somalia. We're taking the same lessons. General Ham is taking the same lessons and applying those to other areas in the region, trying to determine how can we best assist the countries in the region through intelligence, through training, through uh, our presence, uh, be able to ensure that we develop better security in their countries as well. And he's doing a great job at uh, developing that capacity. Mr. Secretary, would, would you 
Are, are you suggesting, I should say, that part of what we've done in Somalia and what we see developing in these other countries is by focusing on resource shortages, creating more educational opportunities, uh, using smart power, if you will, we're, we're seeing some success. It's conditional success, but what's happening in Somalia it gives us hope that there's f further utility for these approaches. I agree with that. Yeah. Could I turn, since you're here, and I know uh, this is on everybody's mind, to sequestration? Um, would you uh, lay out uh, your thoughts uh, generally or specifically? In particular, if, if we uh, allow sequestration to take hold, would that require a fundamental change in our national military strategy? Absolutely. I'd have to. Uh, I, as, as I've said, you know, look, the $487 billion that we were handed through the Budget Control Act uh, to be able to reduce the defense budget over 10 years, uh, we, we understood that we had a responsibility to do our part uh, with regards to deficit reduction. But we wanted to do it in a way that wouldn't hollow out the force or make these across-the-board cuts that would uh, hurt every area of the military. So we developed a, a strategy, a defense strategy, that we thought represented uh, what the force of the 21st century ought to look like. And then we built a budget based on that, and we've recommended savings pursuant to that budget uh, that were incorporated in our FY13 budget. Uh, and we're, frankly, we were doing the same thing for FY14. If sequester takes place and we suddenly have another half a trillion dollars that I got to take out of the defense budget in an across-the-board fashion, frankly, the defense strategy we put in place, I'd have to throw out the window. And we would, we would, we would clearly impact seriously uh, particularly on maintenance and readiness. As I said, we, we would have a terrible readiness crisis. But as time went on uh, and the erosion that would take place in our capabilities, uh, instead of being a first-rate power in the world, we'd, we'd turn into a second-rate power. That would be the result of sequester. General Jeffs, if I could follow up on the Secretary's general analysis of where we are. We're talking about increasing the number of Marine security personnel at our embassies. If sequestration went into uh, effect, uh, how would that uh, affect our, our other missions? I, I, I think this is uh, – you're, you're, you're potentially robbing Peter to pay Paul. It, well, that's right. And we haven't done that analysis, but what I, what I will say is it would cause us – we have to go back and look at our national security interests, uh, and, uh, as we always do, and, and make sure that we're addressing them in the right priority. And it w I think where you would see it affect us uh, most quickly and most prominently is in the, you know, we, last year we talked about rebalancing to the Pacific. We also talk internally about the balance we have kind of vertically. If rebalancing to the Pacific is a horizontal activity, vertically we have to decide how much of the force can we have forward, how much rotational, how much in the, home, in the, in the homeland. And I, that balance would change, and you'd have less ability to project power forward, which means you're less able to deter and deter enemies and assure allies. That's a significant change. The second place is in the defense industrial base. We would have significant challenges in our factories and our depots that ha will have a long-term effect. I know my time's expired, and you may want to answer this for the record later, but we're just finally, it feels like, getting a handle on ops tempo for our personnel. And what I hear you implying in that answer is that we're going to go right back to a one-to-one -one or a, a one-to-two even uh, ops tempo for the, our men and women in uniform. And we've asked a lot of them over the last 12 years. We've really yeah, stressed I, I can the answer that really quickly. I, I, you won't find this chairman arguing that we need to do more with less. You'll yeah. find me arguing that if that happens, we need to do less with less. Mm -hmm. We'll leave it there. Thank you again, gentlemen. Thank you, Senator Udall. Senator Chan